Following our i5-2500K revisit, we received a lot of requests to produce a similar revisit for the i7-2600K Sandy Bridge CPU from 2011. That was Intel's then flagship Core Series CPU. In this revisit, we'll be testing the 2600K for stock performance and overclock performance in games on the bench, alongside some synthetic tests and a Blender test pass. Before that, this coverage is brought to you by the Computex Conference, which runs from May 30th to June 3rd in Taipei, Taiwan this year. Computex is the biggest event of the year for PC hardware and technology, where we preview the newest prototypes before they come to market. We can recommend attending or following this event online for pros and enthusiasts in the market. Learn more at the link in the description below. For anyone who saw our Ryzen revisit from two days ago at this point, you know that there are some fairly important updates to Total War, Warhammer, and Battlefield 1 that impact the results of Ryzen testing after the updates. You can check that content for the full detail. So note here that we have not fully retested everything with those two games yet. The Ryzen CPUs that were retested were the 1700X primarily. There was some 1700 retesting, but not a whole lot. And Intel has not been rerun through those two games either. So uh, this content was tested, written, and more or less produced during the same week as the Ryzen revisit content, with the exception of running those tests because we had already conducted them previously. Uh, so we will do further updates with the R5 reviews coming soon. Uh, but for today, we have not included the full retest suite of Intel CPUs with those games. There may be changes going forward. We will see uh, the i7-2600K has been run through all of the standard games in our bench though, along with some synthetics. So we do have a pretty damn good idea of where the CPU stands today. As demonstrated with the 2500K, old k -SKU Sandy Bridge CPUs were able to overclock upwards of 4.5 to 4.8 gigahertz with reasonable cooling, but the stock i7-2600K regularly outperformed our 4.5 gigahertz 2500K in synthetic benchmarks and in thread intensive games like Watch Dogs 2. Although we ended the 2500K revisit with the conclusion that now is a good time to start thinking about an upgrade to Kaby Lake or Ryzen, i7 CPUs are conceived as more future-proof. Today, we'll be testing that conception to see how it holds up to reality some five or six years later. With R5s around the corner, now is a good time to start building on this data, and of course we'll iterate once the review embargo lifts for those CPUs. Just to remind everyone of the specs, the i7-2600K is a Sandy Bridge architecture part, it was uh, it shipped with a base frequency of 3.4 gigahertz and boosted to 3.8 gigahertz out of the box. The CPU also is part of Intel's long-standing i7 core architecture for the enthusiast lineup, meaning that it runs four cores and eight threads with the help of hyper-threading. And points of interest here, Sandy Bridge was interesting for two main reasons that we should talk about today. And one of those is the dies were soldered to the IHS in most cases and that's something Intel has not done for a number of years. Uh, now they do thermal compound or TIM for the most part for their modern TPUs. And the other interesting point is that Sandy Bridge had some challenges with hyper-threading that we haven't talked about in a very long time because it hasn't really been a modern part to review. So uh, the challenges there were there generally was no appreciable improvement in frame rate with the games out when the, the CPU launched, and even in follow-up testing years later, like with Metro Last Light, uh, the only benefit was really in some of the frame times, so that wasn't something that people were paying attention to at that time. This is kind of before the tech report and PC per frame time revolution. So it's interesting to look back at it now, now that we have more tools and we have a new test approach. And when I say we, I mean the industry as a whole in general, not just Gamers Nexus. Uh, so frame times will be interesting to look at here because they were never really a focus when this chip came out. We, in the old days, saw something like a 1% to 2% performance hit at times with hyper-threading on or off on the original hyper-threaded chips, and that was an overhead thing. These days, that's more or less gone. In fact, if you disable hyper-threading on the 7700K, you'll see a pretty big performance hit as in a bad thing. Uh, so it's performing as it should be these days. For full testing methodology, check the link in the description below for Patrick's article. We talk about the CPUs tested, how they were tested, and things like that in the article. We will not be approaching some of the topics here today like thermals and power testing because that stuff is going to be the same as it was when the chip launched. So it's not really a relevant factor in what we're looking at, which is gaming performance and synthetic or render performance. Thermals haven't changed, power hasn't changed other than potentially the difference in modern coolers being much better than they were then.
so that's all down there. We've added KB Lake 7350K CPUs, FX8370 CPUs, and Ryzen CPUs to these charts, which were not present in the 2500K revisit. That may be interesting. And uh, the updates have not fully cascaded through all of our CPUs, as stated earlier. So that means Total War and Battlefield needs to be rerun on the 2600K and everything else for the most part. But this is still good data to provide a foundation of how it's aged today, especially because those updates most likely impacted Ryzen more than the other chips, but we'll soon see if that's the case. We're starting with Blender and then some synthetic benchmarks, and we'll move on to gaming after that. At stock frequency, the 2600K took 73.9 minutes to render our Blender scene, which was made in-house. For a comparison, that's about 74% slower than the modern i7, that's the 7700K, which finished in 42.4 minutes. A 4.7 gigahertz overclock on the 2600K proved a little unstable with Blender initially, as usual, as this is the longest running CPU test we execute, but stabilized after further increasing vCore, we were at about 1.35 volts, maybe a little more at times. The 4.7 gigahertz OC allowed the render to complete in 54.5 minutes, which is just behind the i7-4790K stock and just ahead of the i5-7600K overclocked. In this regard, the older i7 is showing its thread advantage over even the newest i5 KB Lake CPU, given that Blender doesn't care much about anything other than pure thread count. Of course, clock helps a bit, but not that much. The OC decreases render time by 26% compared to the stock 2600K, and the 7700K itself only reduced its render time by 9.7% through overclocking, so this is a pretty big gain for the Sandy Bridge CPU. For owners of the 2600K who bought the chip originally for a cheap hedge between gaming and TV production workloads, now is not a bad time to upgrade if you've become unsatisfied with performance. Of course, if you're happy with it, don't bother. But if you need more out of it, the R7-1700 completes the same render task in 33 minutes without an overclock for a time reduction of 40% over the overclocked 2600K. That said, if you only care about gaming, the needs and recommendations change. We'll get to that shortly in the gaming section. Moving on to Cinebench, we're on another multi-threaded test that favors raw thread count over clock speed, though it's not bad to have both. The overclocked 2600K scored 830.5, much higher than its original score of 622 without the overclock, but also much lower than any modern 8-thread CPU. A more reasonable comparison to modern i5s reveals how well the 2600K has held on comparatively. The i5-7600K, a 4-core processor released in 2017, actually scored 5% lower thanks to its lack of hyper-threading. Our highest scoring 4-core i7 with 8 threads, the 7700K at 5.1 GHz, did exceed the 2600K by 35% for a total score of 1122, and the R7-1700 at 4 GHz with 2933 MHz memory scored 1764 in this test, though with lower single-core performance than the overclocked 2600K. On to Firestrike. The 2600K's original score in Firestrike's demanding physics test was 9033, sandwiching it between the newer i5s and our results. Although it managed to clean on and outperform the stock i5-6600K, the stock i5-7600K finally surpassed the Sandy Bridge i7. Once overclocked though, the score jumped to 12,057, just shy of the i7-4790K stock performance, and higher than every i5 tested, overclocked or not. Looking at these metrics as FPS numbers rather than scores, the 2600K at 4.7 GHz lands at 38.3 FPS for the physics CPU test, whereas the stock 2600K runs at 28.7 FPS. Between them, the i5-7600K and its overclocked variant land in the 30s, with the 4790K just above the overclocked 2600K. The R7-1700 stock with 2666 MHz memory performs around 53 FPS, with the newest Gen i7 at 46 FPS. Time Spy benchmark results will be published on the website in the article, again linked below if you want to see those. But for now, we're going to move into the gaming benchmarks. Performance in Watch Dogs 2 was one of the things that necessitated this article in the first place. In our 2500K revisit, the overclocked 2500K only managed to eke out 67 FPS average, while the 2600K stock hit nearly 74 with no overclock at all. At 4.7 GHz, the 2600K moves from 73.7 .7 average with lows at 54 and 48 to 89.3 FPS average with lows at 64 and 52. This is higher than the R7-1800X's overclocked peak, both with comparable lows, and it's higher than any non-hyperthreaded Intel CPU, 
including the 7700K with hyperthreading disabled. The overclock 2600K is performing right around where the overclock 1700 performs, or about 21% behind the 7700K stock. Watch Dogs 2 is really a best case scenario, since it takes advantage of the available threads more than most of the other games will. As far as Watch Dogs 2 goes, upgrading would involve buying a modern i7, a 4790K or newer that is, or finding an especially robust R7. None of these seem particularly worth it alone, that'd be from Intel or AMD, but if you're also upgrading for other reasons, like modernized I.O. and chipsets or other games, then there's more to consider, and we'll obviously continue going through to look at those numbers. Improvements were slightly less impressive in Total War Warhammer when compared to Watch Dogs 2, but a 15% increase in average FPS with overclocking really isn't bad, particularly when looking at the 1% low boon. 130 FPS still isn't exactly competitive when compared to the newest chips on the market, and it lags behind even the overclocked i3 7350K. It seems that, as we saw in our initial Ryzen reviews, Total War Warhammer isn't necessarily fully leveraging the number of threads available to it. That said, and this is really important, there's since been an update to Total War Warhammer that we found to improve Ryzen performance in an important way, and you can find that in our previous Ryzen coverage just from a few days ago. This might also hold true for the i7-2600K, but we are still retesting the Intel chips in Total War Warhammer and will update in time for the R5 reviews, probably very shortly. GTA 5 also ran at about 130 FPS average, this time improving from 104 FPS. GTA has engine constraints that exhibit themselves with the i5 CPUs, as we've discussed a few times in the past, so the 2600K is stuck with comparisons only to R7s and i7s due to issues with the i5s and probably other CPUs in the near future, but that is an engine constraint, not a CPU issue, and it's something we've talked about in the past if you're curious to learn more. It affects both AMD and Intel when four cores or a similar core count is available. We see the overclocked 2600K performing below the stock 4790K at 141 FPS average and 99 FPS 1% to lows. That's ahead of the R7 family of CPUs, the R7 1700X with a 3466 megahertz memory overclock and 3.9 gigahertz core overclock is able to outperform the 2600K in average frame rate though. And if you are curious about those numbers again, the previous content talks about how we were able to push the R7 to that point. Metro Last Light follows the same trend as other titles and is an interesting one to include because it came out about two years after this CPU was released. So that really puts into perspective how old the 2600K is at this point. It offers a moderate improvement, again, to about 130 FPS, and that means beating the i5 CPUs and even the R7s, but the 2600K still can't quite approach the 4790K. This could be due to something of a memory ceiling, being that we're limited to 2133 MHz, but regardless, it's quite an achievement for the CPU, given, again, the age of the chip and the date of Metro Last Light. Sandy Bridge CPUs are an interesting thing to study because of how they've held on. First of all, advances in modern technology, particularly on the storage front, like USB updates, again, three is a new thing with the chips compared to Sandy Bridge. So USB 3.1 Gen 2, M.2 devices, NVMe as a protocol. These updates to I.O. have made the Sandy Bridge series increasingly obsolete if that's something you care about. But at the same time, it's held on reasonably when you consider things like modern coolers being pretty damn affordable comparatively, especially in the liquid market where CLCs are now really fairly ubiquitous. The affordability of those coolers and the ease of access to overclocking, thanks to dozens of guides all over the net, because this is an old chip now, mean that you can overclock this thing pretty easily. So if you own a 2600K and you're not ready to upgrade yet, there's two things to think about. One, are you happy with how it's performing today? Maybe you are. If that's the case, who cares? Keep waiting until it is dissatisfying to use the chip. The second question is, are you willing to overclock it to get it on par with something like a modern i5? or even just under something like a 14790K in terms of the Intel comparative charts. If you are, it takes maybe an hour of work, maybe two, to get a fairly stable high overclock on the 2600K chips. We were pushing 4.7. The range seems to be about 4.5 and higher. I know back in the day, some people were hitting five gigahertz on liquid, but uh, definitely 4.5 is fairly reasonable to assume possible with some effort into the tuning. And you can find all kinds of guides to help with that. So if you can do that, you're looking at gains that are definitely something that can actually help push performance 
to, again, modern i5 levels. In terms of upgrades, if you are on an i7-2600K originally, then assuming you're building a system with a similar cost to back then, you're probably looking at something like an i7-7700K or an R7 chip, maybe the 1700. Those would be the kind of the two similar options in terms of price for what you're getting. Now, this goes back to our 1700 review, and then you should look at our revisit from a few days ago as well if you're looking at Ryzen. Basically, if you're doing pure gaming and nothing else, it's not a bad upgrade to go to something like a 7700K from a 2600K, especially if you're gonna overclock the 7700K to, to get that kind of gain back from where you were overclocked on the 2600K. Now, the R7 chips come into play when you're looking at something like Blender, where uh, the difference in Blender or other CPU-based rendering tasks, if you perform those, would be larger between the 7700K and the 1700, well, when overclocked especially, then perhaps the difference uh, with gaming in some games. But for pure gaming, especially at higher refresh rates, the 7700K is what we'd push you toward. If you're doing those mixed workloads or more production heavy stuff, consider Ryzen. We've got plenty of coverage for you on that. If you're curious about Ryzen and are out of the game or haven't built something in, uh, since you built the 2600K system, Overall, it's held on pretty damn well. Keep an eye out for our R5 CPU reviews. Those will be coming out very shortly. If you're in an upgrade cycle and in a holding pattern, it's not going to hurt you to wait another week. We'd suggest checking those out. Uh, thanks for watching as always. Subscribe for more. Patreon.com slash GamersNexus for more information on how you can help us push this type of content going forward. I'll see you all next time.